Next time you're on YouTube, check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material from the podcast plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. Welcome to D-Day in 90 Minutes, our 15-part weekly podcast series that delves deep into the historic Allied invasion that turned the tide of World War II. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy this latest installment. D-Day in 90 Minutes, written by William Bradle, Robert Child, narrated by Travis. Planning and Training Forget this goddamn thing. You get your ass on the beach. I'll be there waiting for you, and I'll tell you what to do. There ain't anything in this plan that is going to go right. Colonel Paul Pop Good, 175th Regiment, 29th Division. 12,000 airborne paratroopers, 7,000 ships, and 160,000 men to be landed on six beaches in one day. That was the plan. The German plan, or at least Rommel's plan, was to stop the invasion at water's edge. Montgomery went into detail on Good Friday, April 7th, presenting the finalized plan to division and corps commanders, starting with the British and Canadians. They would land on the east beaches, preceded by British paratroopers, who would seize the bridges across the Orne River, denying access to the invasion's left flank. The British 3rd Division would come up from Sword Beach to capture the important port town of Caen. The Canadians would come up from Juneau and cut the Caen to Bayou Roadway. The British 50th Division would land at Gold and come up to the same roadway. The U.S. 1st and 29th would land at Omaha Beach, then push inland, capturing Colleville, Pierreville, and San Laurent. Rangers would land on the west side of Omaha and knock out the batteries on the cliffs of Pointe du Oak. The 4th Infantry Division would land at Utah and head right for Cherbourg. The 82nd and 101st would precede them in a night jump to secure the roads and blow bridges. As with all plans, execution is everything, and the men, the sailors, flyers, paratroopers, Rangers and infantry were trained accordingly. Few of the soldiers on the ground in the sea had seen combat, but they were trained for it with all the emphasis on getting and moving ashore. Training for anything beyond D-Day was ignored. If they didn't get ashore and stay ashore, there was no need to train for anything else. Large amounts of training went into attacking fixed positions like pillboxes and concrete gun emplacements. The rifle squads were taught to split up, advance, and when one man took fire, he was to stop while his teammates advanced, all the time the team putting fire on the target. Eventually, members of the team would advance close enough to throw a grenade or satchel charge into the target, then on to the next one. First, the troops had to get ashore, and so they practiced and practiced landings. The landing crafts differed in name, use, and size. The LST stood for landing ship tanks and was the largest at 400 feet long, 49 feet across, and could sail in less than 15 feet of water. It was capable of carrying 20 tanks, 27 other vehicles, and 200 men. Top speed was 14 miles per hour, but they seldom went that fast, as the flat bottom made the vehicle hard to handle in anything but a smooth sea. The American models were powered by two General Motor diesel engines. Because they were considered ships, the LSTs were given names. All other crafts were numbered. In the U.S. Navy, a vessel has to be at least 200 feet long to be considered a ship. The largest of the landing crafts were the LCIs and the LCTs, landing craft infantry and landing craft tanks. They were 158 feet in length, powered by eight GM engines, and capable of operating in less than six feet of water. They had a bow that opened, and ladder ramps on each side of the troops to descend into the water. The LCI could carry 200 troops, the LCTs up to five tanks, depending on size. The crew was one officer, 12 enlisted. The most iconic landing craft in World War II was the LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. It is more widely known as the Higgins boat. 
The Higgins boat is 36 feet long, 11 feet wide, and can float in three feet of water. It was plywood with a metal drop-down bow ramp. The boat carries 36 men, is powered by either a diesel or gas engine, and capable of speeds of 14 miles per hour. The four crewmen were all enlisted. Armament was two 30 caliber machine guns. The Higgins boat was the brainchild of Andrew Higgins, an oil industry worker who started his maritime career building flat-bottom boats for oil workers in the swamps of southern Louisiana. His boat for the oil industry was named the Eureka Boat and made entirely of wood. Higgins, seeing the war coming and positive there would be a shortage of steel, bought the entire 1939 mahogany crop of the Philippines to build his wood-based design. The Marine Corps were the first to realize a need for landing craft, and the Navy opened a competition. The Navy hated the Higgins design, but the Marines, the ones who would be doing the landings, loved it, and Higgins got the contract. Higgins was the Henry Ford of landing craft, opening assembly lines all over New Orleans and then hiring subcontractors around the country. 20,000 Higgins boats were built during the war and used in every theater of war. Higgins was born in Nebraska in 1886 and tossed out of prep school for fighting. He moved to Mobile, Alabama and entered the wood importing business. He built up a shipping fleet and a resulting shipping yard to get the wood to his business. The import business went bankrupt, but Higgins kept the shipyard where he invented and built the Higgins boat. Higgins was a great inventor and builder, but drank a bottle of whiskey a day, fought unions, didn't lay off people even as the war ended, went into helicopters, boats, recreational vehicles, and partnered with Preston Tucker, the inventor of the 1948 Tucker sedan. Despite his success with the Higgins landing craft, he was basically a bad businessman, and Higgins Industries went bankrupt in November 1945. Higgins died of stomach issues in 1952. Dwight Eisenhower said Higgins was the man that won the war for us. If Higgins had not designed and built those LCVPs, we never could have landed over an open beach. The whole strategy of the war would have been different. The armies trained for the assault by attacking UK beaches similar to the Normandy beaches. The exercises would start with loading onto various craft then climbing down rope nets into bobbing Higgins boats. The most used beach was Slapton Sands in Devon in southwest England. Slapton Sands was a very good substitute for Omaha Beach, and in August 1943, Slapton Sands began a transformation into Omaha with the construction of metal beach obstacles, as well as a range for artillery and Bangalore explosives and pillboxes to be blown up with hand-carried explosives. The beach had firing ranges for rifles, flamethrowers, grenade launchers, and rockets. At the end of each day and each exercise, the results of the training would be analyzed. What worked, worked. What didn't was changed. One early change was the makeup of the Higgins boat contingents in the early waves. Planners determined that what worked best was a boat containing two officers, a mortar team of four men manning a 60-millimeter mortar, a five-man demolition team, a five-man rifle team, a four-man wire-cutting team using Bangalore torpedoes, a four-man rocket launcher team and a flamethrower, and his assistant backed up by a four-man BAR team. Training was built up from the individual soldier to his team, to his platoon, to his company, to his battalion. Individual training took place on the obstacle course. Team training depended on what the team did rifle squad or demolition, or machine gun support. Then, the teams combined into company exercises and then full-blown battalion exercises, starting with loading, then landing, and advancing. Dress rehearsals took place in April and May 1944, involving the armies, navies, and air power. There was also tragedy and a resulting good guess by the top German, Hitler. On April 27th, German S-boats, S for Schnell or Fast, similar to but bigger than the USPT boat, slipped in among a convoy of LSTs on a practice invasion off Slapton Sands. Two LSTs were sunk and 749 men killed, 300 wounded. 
The raid identified Slapton Sands as a training site, and a report of the raid was sent to Hitler. Hitler, who had never been to England or Normandy, but with a great eye for detail, asked if Slapton Sands beaches were similar to the Normandy beaches. His guess was right, and Hitler ordered more troops to the area. There were positives for the Allies from the debacle with the realization that there were no rescue craft assigned to the exercise, and the men had not been instructed in inflating their life preservers, nicknamed May Wests. British and American radio signals were on different bands. All this was corrected prior to the real invasion. Paratroopers did three-day exercises, beginning with a jump and then marches, exercises, and a march back to base. Glider pilots wore blackout glasses to simulate flying into their targets at night, timing their movements with stopwatches. Rangers scaled cliffs in Scotland that mimicked the cliffs of Pointe du Hoc. The whole purpose of the exercises was to make the real thing seem like second nature. Of course, it was not, but the repetition, real bullet exercises, and constant training was bringing the men to a peak. After a three-day exercise, one paratrooper said, combat can't be that tough. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the series. Be sure to be with us for our next installment. I'm Robert Child, and this has been D-Day in 90 Minutes, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.